Although Wolfensberger dismissed them as passing crazes, many of the ideas that have taken hold in human services have their roots in normalization and social role valorization. One of these is self-advocacy, the political and social movement of people with intellectual disabilities speaking up for themselves. It takes all of us to make a difference. Wolf was never a, a fan of self-advocacy either. He was very upset about it. You know, people, people need advocates. If they don't have, if their life is not so they can man maintain it. Now, why do they suddenly not need advocates? <laughs> you know? So he, this was another thing he wasn't happy about. The, the radical individualism and self-determination puts the individual literally at the, uh, in a position of a, of a godlet, including a godlet with all sorts of entitlements that other people are obliged to provide and meet. Uh, so in, in, uh, it was a classical tradition that rights and obligations went, to, went hand in hand, that for every right you had to have an obligation. And the uh, radical individualism movement has denied that. They said, I have the rights, other people have the obligations. And it is a, 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 a dramatic, uh, a dramatic evolu step in, you know, in, in uh, evolution of people's thinking and in terms of uh, uh, social theory, you might say, and, and political theory, uh, to adhere to that sort of uh, absurd belief that this is, is possible, that so societies can function like that. You know? that's, that's another one of those modernistic, uh, entitled, uh, modernistic uh, affluent uh, fantasies. Wolf, in his later years, certainly uh, was not fully supported of the self-advocacy movement. Um, he, unlike Gunnar, for instance, did not sort of move as the field and the vision moved. And I never thought that Wolfensberger was strong enough on self-expression and on people actually acting on their own behalf and not trying to fit into a norm. We had some very, and we do have some very extraordinary people who happen to have disabilities where it's a disservice if we try to f force them to fit a certain conceptual premise. And so to me, where I went with that was that the, the fundamental application of normalization was that people should have a normal range of options to be themselves. Wolf had trouble with the, the congregation, that it was a party of people with disabilities um, and very often the support folks really were very paternalistic, maternalistic. It re reinforced a lot of the stereotyped roles that he wrote about in the origin of our institutional model. Uh, now there's this interesting phenomenon where the phrase self-advocacy and self-advocate is largely limited to folks with intellectual disabilities, folks that used to be called mentally retarded. Uh, most of the folks who are strong advocates who have got physical disabilities tend not to use that word and they tend not to participate and in fact they often want to distinguish themselves because they want to make it clear that they don't have an intellectual disability. Hear people testify and they say, my legs don't work but I'm smart, you know, and testifying at, at legislative hearings or even public speaking. And, and in many places, including in my community, self-advocate has become a polite word for intellectual disability, a polite word for mental retardation. Um, I was at the restaurant and I saw three self-advocates there. Well, they weren't, they weren't advocating on their own behalf. They were well-composed, articulate people who obviously had developmental disabilities. And so um, self-advocate has, has, I think, become really muddled to be just another polite word. Uh, people were using developmental disability, and then folks like me insist on pointing out not everybody with a developmental disability has an intellectual disability, and I think you really mean intellectually disabled, but we don't want to say that word, so we're saying self-advocate. 
I understand the idea of the image juxtaposition of having lots of people together, and, and it, it doesn't reinforce people as, as you know, being individuals and, and, uh, and um, you know, that whole group thing. I mean, obviously, we've been working around that for a long time, trying to get beyond that. But the power of self-advocacy is, is the civil rights aspect of self-advocacy, you know, people getting together, being leaders. I mean, in, term, in terms of a, of a valued role, what an incredible valued role for a person with disabilities to be to, to speak up for themselves and to be heard and then to speak up for other people as leaders and, and committed advocates for others, which is what self-advocates do so well. Um, people don't just speak up for themselves. They speak up for their friends and their, their people in their community and people in other countries. And, uh, and people groove to that right away. They get right into that. And uh, so I could never understand why that wasn't perceived as an unbelievable extension of normalization. I just could never get that. Well, when I started working for People First of Ontario, obviously I'd already done a lot of study in social role valorization. And so I tried to think about that a lot, about whether a self-advocate is a valued role or what, what kind of role it is. And I think it depends on how big of a role you make it. Um, social role valorization talks about um, oftentimes with devalued people, um, roles that otherwise for anyone else might be a small role becomes enlarged because there's a lack of valued roles that are typically big ones. So whether those are relationship roles or um, employment roles, that kind of thing. So I do see that um, the self-advocate role often can become overly enlarged. Um, but... On the other hand, I think that it does give people access to things that they might not otherwise have. Obviously, a support network, um, different connections, um, confidence boosting, um, skills that they might not otherwise have any uh, way of accessing. Um, and, I mean, aside from valued role, devalued role, I think it gives people a, a real sense of place. Um, it can, anyways. Mm -hmm. I think, and I only had one conversation with Wolf about self-advocacy because it was clear that he didn't hold the movement in much high regard. Although I saw it, again, as this very natural outgrowth of normalization and even social role valorization. It's a very, na very natural outgrowth to me. Um, but Wolfensberger didn't see it that way. Um, but I, I, I inferred from what he said that he also found troubling that um, some of the folks who were speaking as self-advocates, um, number one, were not as disabled as the folks they're talking about or re representing, so that it isn't truly self-advocacy, kind of folks who were either in the very old definition of mental retardation, the pre-1970s definition where it was a much higher IQ cutoff, or who'd been wrongly placed in institution and, and had legitimate beefs, but didn't really have the kind of disability um, that the movement seemed to represent, uh, and or that they uh, adopted jargon and polemics that were other people's battles, that they were pawns, maybe unwitting pawns in other battles. And so the union or the staff could get self-advocates to argue a point, and then it was, it was hard to refute. So between it sometimes being uh, very deviancy enhancing uh, and sometimes maybe seeming a bit like a, a front, um, I think those were the two reasons that Wolfensberger found it troubling. I certainly have seen it be more social than I think is desirable. I certainly have seen situations where I think the people that are doing all the speaking are not representative uh, and maybe are being... Uh, are, are, are being pawns of other folks. But again, the, the essence of it is just so powerful that people themselves speaking on their own behalfs. My biggest problem with the phrase self-advocacy, uh, the way that it's been misused, the same way normalization has been misused by critics. And so I uh, go around and work with community service agencies or boards of directors and talk about how to uh, support a person with a disability, a person who they support in their residences or their workshops, to have that person be on the board of directors, to be in central meetings, to be at the table 
when the agency is being discussed. And so being nice and literal, they would say, well, David is a self-advocate. When we're discussing David, David can be in the room to advocate for himself. And whenever we talk about individuals, they are there. But when we talk about the agency or when we talk about other people or global policies, that is not about them. And so a self-advocate is not appropriate at the table. Um, and so just like saying, oh, we're not going to make people normal, people would seize on that word self. And so Bernard Carabello, a brilliant man who grew up at, uh, grew up at Willowbrook State School, was discovered by Geraldo Rivera. Uh, Bernard clearly does not have any intellectual disability, but he was placed at Willowbrook. He's now a brilliant advocate, travels and consults and uh, does quality assurance for the state of New York, but gets described as a self-advocate. And Bernard says, when do I grow up enough to get to be an advocate, not a self-advocate? And the fact is there's a spot in which it becomes limiting. It's another role for people to get pigeonholed into.